Hey, I'm Chris Ralph, the Professional Prospector, and this is my channel about helping you to become a better prospector and find more gold. Now, I've been doing a series, I haven't done one in a while, so I thought I should do one. I've been doing a series on the geology of placer gold. I've come out to an old placer mine here in California, and I'm filming this. I'm actually gonna be doing some prospecting myself here shortly, once I get done with this filming. But it's a great question. What are the origins of placer gold? How did the gold get here that the miners mined? You know, what are the sources? Is it always just quartz veins or are there some other kind of deposits that form placer gold and contribute placer gold into a system? We're gonna talk about all of that and get into the details of the origins of placer gold. Now, I'm not gonna talk about how gold came from outer space or something like that. I'm just talking about the geology here on good old planet Earth, talking about the geology of how gold gets into placer deposits, streams, deserts, other places, and, and how you can find more of it. Because the more you know about the origins of placer gold, hey, the better places you can put yourself in and the more gold you're gonna find. So come along with me. We're going to do a session on this and take a look at a lot of different things together today and explore the origins of placer gold. Well, today I'm excited to talk to you about the origin of placer gold. This is another segment in my Geology of Placer Deposits series. And we're going to talk about where nuggets come from. And because the truth is, knowing the origins of placer gold will help you find more. Now this is 42 ounces of Arizona gold that was found by a friend of mine, metal detecting. A pretty impressive find, but uh, you know, he knows a lot. He's, he's a practical kind of guy. He's not got any special degrees in geology or anything, but he's learned a lot about where gold comes from over the years. And I'm going to try to impart some of that what I know as well to you. Now here is a piece of gold as it comes out of the vein kind of system. You know, a typical placer nugget that hasn't traveled any distance at all in a stream. You can see all the sharp edges and it's kind of a, a matted mass of little crystals that are all together. Here's another one, the same sort of thing. Both of those, the other one and this one are from California. And you can see all the little triangular crystals that are all matted together. This is basically how gold grows. And we're going to take a look further at this a little further on in this segment. Now, here is an unusual piece of gold. It's a series of wires that have grown together to form what they call a ram's horn. It's from Gilman, Colorado. Uh, and a very unusual uh, type of, of thing for gold to form in this type of way. But wires are not unusual. This is from uh, Colorado also, a, a mass of wires kind of grown together. Here's another specimen from California. This is called actually a tree because it's a bunch of crystals grown together like leaves. And of course gold, once it has traveled down the road a ways and been abraded in rivers and streams, then it becomes more rounded. And some of these pieces range from a few rounded edges to uh, pretty round, um, but they still haven't traveled that far and haven't been that beaten up. But the question becomes, where does the gold in nuggets and other things like this come from? Well, the chief source is probably quartz veins. Here's some gold that's actually still in its original mother quartz that was found with a metal detector. And this is the kind of thing that becomes the source of gold nuggets as it's broken up in rivers and streams. Here's another piece of quartz. It's a beautiful piece with some gold shot all through it. It also was found with a metal detector. This piece had multiple ounces of gold in it when it was broken up. It's a, a valuable piece. And this kind of gold is, is really, really valuable and, and, and it actually fetches a premium um, over the basic price of the gold that's contained within it. Again, another interesting specimen of gold in quartz. So it's true that a lot of the gold that we find as placer comes from quartz veins. And as these veins are broken up, they get into the gravels. But where do the quartz veins come from? 
You know, that's a good question there. Well, this is a hot springs in California, uh, located in the eastern side of the Sierra, near the border with California, or I'm sorry, near the border with Nevada. And there, you can see that the the steam coming up from the pools is follows a line. It follows sort of a fault zone that uh, this hot springs has sprung up, and it it's pretty likely that down deep hundreds and hundreds of feet below the surface here there is probably a quartz vein forming with some gold and maybe some silver and that someday maybe if this were ever shoved up to the surface if the the steam and hot springs died down and it had a chance to cool off that eventually this would be a golden or silver bearing quartz vein now here is a sort of diagram of those things and you can see up on the surface the blue with the little white puffs of steam that's like the hot springs that we just looked at and you know in that surface zone you might find some pyrite and maybe some mercury once in a while some gold but you get down a little further a few hundred feet and you start getting into a more vein type of system where you might find some gold you might find a little silver but then further down there's what they have diagrammed here as the main precious metal horizon. And this is where you'd find literally bonanza level, super rich uh, gold and silver. Uh, gold will be in the form of electrum, which is a silver rich alloy of gold. And further down, you get the base metal horizon, where you start losing the precious metals and getting more into your lead and zinc and copper and that sort of thing. And the different colors uh, plot the different types of alteration that you might see associated with this type of system. So remember this, that gold and, and silver veins form from circulating hot waters and that the water uh, deposits the, both the quartz and the sulfides like pyrite and silver sulfides and that sort of thing. And that once it's spent and uh, the precious metals have come out of it, then it continues on to the surface where you might see a little bit of steam and maybe some mercury deposits, that sort of thing. But, you know, we're not looking for gold veins that are hundreds of feet down because that's going to be pretty tough for an individual prospector to work. We're looking for veins, you know, as they might be exposed. Here is a vein in a a mine in California and it's got some visible gold you can see the visible gold in this area there's some more gold down here and this is just a really rich quartz vein in a, a district that's well known for its rich quartz but you know we want to know too well, what the quartz veins look like on the surface well I gotta tell you there's a lot of different possibilities now some places you have an outcropping dike. You see the dark rock next to the white is a, a dike, and the white colored material, that's your quartz vein, has grown alongside the dike. That's where it formed in this particular case. But because of the dike, it's lifted up and it is kind of sticking up above the ground level. Here's another quartz vein that's sticking well up above the ground level, and so you can see it pretty plainly. It's, it's plenty obvious. But quartz veins aren't always this obvious. Sometimes they're more in the same level as the ground surface. See, this one shows, as you can see, a few pieces in place, but there's some kind of broken pieces next to it. And this is an outcrop also. This is an outcrop of a quartz vein. And certainly around places like this are good places to look with a metal detector or if you're doing other kinds of prospecting. Sometimes all you get from a quartz vein is not a trace or an obvious one like we could just see, but just an accumulation of boulders and pebbles and chunks of quartz. That's all you'll get that really marks that there's a vein in the area. And you may have to do some digging if you want to expose the vein and see where it actually is. But still, this kind of quartz is, is worth prospecting and testing and looking to see whether it's got valuable gold in, inside. Now I gotta tell you a lot of 
uh, gold bearing, a lot of quartz, just regular quartz veins. Most quartz veins don't have a lot of gold in them. Quartz is made from the two most common elements on the Earth's crust, silicon and oxygen. And when you have just silicon and oxygen come together, you get quartz. A small amount of silicon and oxygen forms a few other minerals, but the mass of, of uh, silicon and oxygen on Earth, that when it's just them, is in the form of quartz. And so uh, gold is a whole lot rarer than quartz, and so a lot of quartz veins will maybe only have small traces of gold in them. Some quartz veins don't outcrop at all. This quartz vein, as you can see, is buried over by about five feet of soil and debris and loose material that's kind of slumped down on top of it. And this it would only be exposed just because, well, it's in a road cut. If, if this were just on the side of the hill, the quartz vein would be there, buried, but you wouldn't be able to see it at all. Now, does all nugget gold, does all placer gold come from quartz veins? Well, the answer is no. There are also other formations, fault-related, usually what they call shear zones or shear fractures, that open up areas um, for gold-bearing solutions to deposit gold. This is a diagram of a fault zone, and actually fault zones are common places for quartz veins to be in, in place, but you can see the, the fault zone is kind of offset here. As it's offset, it opens up a series, uh, a little network of shear fractures in, in a zone of what they call extension. It's oftentimes that in little tiny shears like this that you will get placer gold because basically the gold bearing solutions that form the veins um, form quartz first and at the end of the process is the gold rich phase and so at the middle of the process and the beginning fills up this fault zone and at the end all that's left is this little shear zone uh, of extension and that's when the richest gold bearing solutions come in so not all gold comes in things that look like quartz veins. I've actually found good sized nuggets, half ounce and so, in little shear zones like this where literally there's virtually no quartz, just some iron associated with nuggets. Okay, so we've talked a little bit about the sources that placer gold comes from, the original hard rock sources in the ground that placer gold comes from and how nuggets form and that sort of thing. We've talked about that. But, you know, one of the big questions that guys often ask me is stuff like, how come we can't find the source of the placer gold? I mean, there's a lot of placer gold in this district, wherever you might be in the mountains or the deserts or wherever. Um, how come we can't find where the gold is coming from if there's, there's a lot of placer gold here? How come we don't know? And you know, there's some significant questions and different issues and a lot of places where there's a lot of placer gold, but there's not really any hard rock sources that are known nearby. And we're gonna talk about that part right now. Now, weathering and erosion are what make placers. They're what turns the hard rock deposits that we've been talking about into the placer nuggets that we're interested in finding. It's this weathering and erosion that turns these deposits. So how can you find alluvial placer gold and then trace it to its original source? Well, here's a little diagram that shows like a quartz vein and at the surface you see the, the soil has kind of slumped and shifted the, the broken quartz vein outcrop over a little bit. And then you have what's called an alluvial placer now, there, there's going to be gold. If there's gold in this quartz vein, there'll be gold around the outcrop. And then there'll be gold in the slope downhill. And then it works its way down eventually to some sort of stream or drainage where the gold gets into your normal alluvial placers that we're all used to working along streams or other drainages. The gold comes largely, at least the, the bigger placer deposits, because a lot of the gold in quartz veins 
is really tiny. I mean, it literally a lot of the gold in quartz veins is dust kind of size. And that's not really what you're going to have success with panning or finding with a metal detector. But there are often pockets, even in veins that have mostly, mostly small dust size gold, there'll be pockets where you have coarse gold. And here one shows uh, where a quartz vein crosses over a little line of material, this little DE, uh, from D to E, that little line, where it shifts the vein over and the vein bent. And as it went over this and encountered the other minerals in that little veinlet DE, D to E, um, it was enriched and you had a rich pocket of gold there. And this is a common occurrence. And uh, this is one of the things you want to look out for with looking for rich gold pockets. Now, when a rich pocket or a rich chute uh, erodes into a stream, you basically get it, like I say, working downhill from the quartz vein and then into a drainage. Sometimes small drainages, like shown here on the left, uh, may have richer concentrations of gold simply because they take more uh, vein matter in per area that they drain than uh, larger drainages. But uh, this just shows diagrammatically how um, a quartz vein erodes into the gravel and um, becomes a placer deposit. And you can see here, here's a, a, just a, a large river in California. This is a part of the American River system, how it cut through and just erodes down the rocks. And, you know, what gold is in the rocks gets concentrated into the river. Now, one of the important things that I get asked about is tracing gold that you find into the original pocket. And I've actually done some of this and it can be pretty rich and actually just following the trace up from up the side of the hill can be pretty rich with a metal detector if you have good coarse gold. Now, let alone the pocket, if, you, if the pocket's still there and you encounter the pocket. This shows that if you're going along a stream and you start to get some gold, that usually there's a, a, a spread of where the gold goes as it works its way downstream. But right below the pocket will be the richest source, kind of in the middle. So you'll get a few pieces, a few pieces, then more, more, more when you're in the middle, and then a few pieces, a few pieces, and then you run out as you're going upstream, right? So, um, Taking samples of the soil or using a metal detector, you can kind of identify the dispersion fan and where the, the richest bit of gold is and follow it up and look for a quartz vein. Now, as we saw earlier in our diagrams, quartz veins don't always outcrop up above the surface. Sometimes they're even with the surface and sometimes they're below the surface. Sometimes you can see a bit of rubble, uh, quartz, broken pieces of quartz that are on the surface. Other times, you know, they're completely covered over and there's just nothing but soil. So it can be hard to identify the pocket, even if you are able to trace it up to the source area. Occasionally, you do this tracing and it turns out that the pocket has already been weathered away. In other words, the rich source pocket that was there at one time has already been eroded down the side of the hill and there's nothing really left of it in the quartz vein. Now this tracing and loaming techniques only works if the drainage is small. In big drainages, it really is tough to do this. And it requires that there only be one source of gold because if you had several pockets contributing several different uh, amounts of gold, you know, trying to find one is kind of like listening for one voice when you walk into a party and there's 50 people talking loudly. It's just real hard to do. You also want areas where the soil isn't too deep and so the gold is shallow and you can get a, a good sample either with your detector or by taking samples of the dirt and panning it. Um, so shallow uh, surface soil is also helpful. And then the slopes of the surrounding hills, you don't want them to be too flat because the flatter they are, the wider this dispersion pattern that I showed you in the previous slide. You see how the dispersion pa pattern is a fan going down the hill. Um, the flatter the hillside, the wider that fan is. 
and the harder it will be to trace. In steep hills, it can be very narrow, actually. So the slopes of the surrounding hills, you don't want them to be too flat. Now, next we're going to talk about something unusual that a lot of guys don't always think of. It's desert or aeolian gold. These are placers that are formed more by wind than by water. They're typically found in rather flat, dry desert locations. Here is an aeolian placer, and I, I got a few nuggets off of this, and, and other people who were there before me got a lot more nuggets. In Western Australia, you can see that the slope is pretty flat. There's white chunks of quartz scattered around, and then the dark color uh, chunks scattered around are actually ironstone, so they're heavy and rich in iron. And in the red soil, there are gold nuggets scattered here and there. And it was uh, an interesting place to prospect. But this is formed literally by what they call deflation, where the soil weathers from rain and water and whatever, and then it just over time, uh, it gets blown by the wind, the, the soil is removed, and the gold isn't removed. Just the clay and really light sand is removed by wind and to a lesser extent by rainwater washing it away. And then what happens is the gold remains behind with things like bigger quartz, uh, chunks of quartz and chunks of ironstone, all of which are resistant to erosion. That's how um, how an aeolian plaster forms. It's the same process that forms what we call in, in the United States, we call desert pavement. Here's a, a me prospecting in Nevada in an aeolian type of plaster. Out on the pediment, there's a, a small mountain range to the left of me, to the left of your view as you're looking at uh, the screen. And you can't see that, but it, it, it's the pediment slope as you go downhill from there. And this area has been windblown and uh, washed by water. And quite a few nuggets were found here in the past. Now, this is a diagram of a pediment slope. Basically, it's the, what I was talking about, where you have uh, in the top one A, mountain range A, and you have this gentle slope coming out of the mountains and you'll have placer gravels and by a matter of wind and uh, and washing to a lesser extent with water you remove the light material like clay and that sort of thing and real fine sand <clears throat> and you have this reconcentration then of gold and sometimes the like you say with uplift it shows in the lower diagram the pediment gets dissected and then you form a new pediment further down, a step down. Now gold is so resistant and durable, um, resistant to any kind of forces of weathering from the air and water, that it just naturally gets recycled through the system more than once. You can actually have a river and uh, it, the river become buried and new rivers form and the gold from the old river then gets washed into the new river. We have a diagram here. This is the, basically the concept of the tertiary gravels in California, but they have similar gravels in Australia and some other places where the old land cycle gravels, the gravels have been buried and now they're on a mountaintop. And as the thing erodes, they'll just get eroded back into the present day riverbeds and then the gold in them will be recaptured into the riverbeds. So the tertiary uh, gravels are up on top or near the top of the mountain, but there's gravel benches, more recent gravel benches that are down on the side of, of the hill. And then all the way down in the bottom of the, the drainage is the present river or stream bed. Here's a, an old uh, tertiary uh, mine, tertiary gravel mine in California, where the miners mined off uh, all the gravels. You can see a few boulders in the foreground that are left behind. But when they mined off the gravels, look, they saw the bedrock underneath is just like old time, just like a river bedrock. It's worn and polished smooth, uh, just in the same way that you might see along a modern stream. And of course, in these rivers, there's 
cobbles and pebbles and uh, that sort of thing, just like you'd see in any modern day river. Only uh, the miners would toss these aside as they uh, shoveled the materials into their sluice boxes. Here's a distant view of a tertiary river in California. You can see the light colored material going across the center of the stream. It basically drained from the right uh, that you're looking at to the left. And you can see it kind of goes downhill that way. And the, the miners mined off most of the gravel in this section that you can see. And, and literally millions of dollars worth of gold were recovered in the form of nuggets and that sort of thing. And, and in fact, uh, modern day prospectors still come here with their metal detectors and find gold. And I found gold in this place as well. So uh, it's, it's an interesting uh, series of things. And there are many rivers of this type in California of which there are bits and pieces uh, still, still present, you know, that haven't been completely eroded away. And some of them have been mined by miners. Some of them have been mined by miners uh, by going underground. Uh, if the river is deeply buried, if it's only shallowly buried, they would do like this, where they hydraulic mined with the water pressure and, and basically blasted off the material. But gold, because it's so durable, gets recycled. The gold that was in a river millions of years ago can find its way back down and into a modern day river. Another force that, um, that basically forms gravels that get recycled is the force of glaciers. Now, glaciers are well known for actually destroying placer deposits because they just rip everything up and mix it all together. But they also rip down the sides of mountains and, and that sort of thing. And sometimes the mountains have gold in them. And where the material has been deposited at the, the front of the glacier, the, all the ripped up material, when water flows back through this and washes the lighter material away, um, the heavier material left behind will be richer in gold, if there's gold in the gravel to begin with. More, most of the time, uh, glacial gravels are very low in grade originally, the, the gravels themselves, but they get reconcentrated and reworked and so you get an enrichment. And this, like I say, this process, it's common in the Midwest where glaciers, big glaciers came down from Canada pushing gold bearing gravels. The gravels are extremely low in grade, but where modern day streams have cut through the, the glacial moraines and, and reconcentrated the gold and washed away the lighter materials, you can get decent accumulations of gold in the Midwest. And this is how this reconcentration of glacier moraines is how uh, the Midwest, most of the Midwest placer deposits were formed. Now, this is a diagram that basically shows a situation where the top level A is just the soil, B is a younger glacial moraine, C is the what was the surface soil before the younger one was laid down, and C is a concentration of the layer below D. So what was D sticking up further was washed and worked and re reprocessed and the lighter materials moved away. And so you end up with this concentration in what was once the surface at C, in C that I've kind of colored in with gray here. And then you have a, a remainder of the D gravel that, uh, that the C was reprocessed from, the stuff that wasn't actually finished processing. It worked its way part way down. Here is a placer mine in California where um, they worked by hydraulic mining glacial gravels and reconcentrated glacial gravels and, and actually recovered quite a bit of gold. You can see that the boulders in this pile are not fully round like a river gravel, but are angular and partly rounded, which is typical of glacial moraines. Now, there are old and discarded theories about how nuggets form, and I thought that I would touch on them because, hey, gold nuggets really don't form that way. Now, here's some beautiful gold nuggets that were picked up, and you can see by looking at them that some of them are pretty rounded and pretty blobby looking, and that led, um, led miners to some unusual conclusions 
many, many years ago, 100 years ago, 150 years ago. One of the conclusions that they decided was that gold nuggets grew in the streams, that the water had somehow traces of gold in it, and the traces of gold uh, somehow made it to the existing nuggets in the, the river, and it would grow um, kind of like a, a nodule growing bigger and bigger. And, and there are some things that grow as nodules. Turquoise grows as a nodule in, uh, in near-surface deposits, but gold doesn't really grow this way. They actually, the science of it is they cut gold nuggets open, and if you take a nugget and you magnify it, super magnify it up, and look at the little crystals within it, if it were growing like a nodule in, in some sort of in a stream or something, it would have a growth pattern like a tree. It would be rings of growth as it grew outwards. But instead you have this uh, mass of little matted crystals all interwoven and grown, kind of like those ones that I showed you uh, at the beginning of this, uh, this section. And all the nuggets, all the, or the nuggets that we were showing you were a mass of crystals all intergrown together. And that's what they look like on the inside, not like some sort of a tree ring growth nodule that grew a little bit at a time outward. So scientists came to the conclusion that, no, uh, gold doesn't grow from rings and nodules uh, as it grows, as it sits in the river. Another pop popular thing that was popular 150 and more years ago was the miners looked at the, the blobby nuggets and thought, well, maybe some volcano shot the nuggets out. You know, it was a volcano that erupted liquid gold and shot nuggets in the air. And as they flew through the air, the nuggets solidified. And that's how you got that blobby shape. Well, you know, that's not how it works. Um, this is a picture of me in Hawaii with some lava going down the side of the hill behind me. Uh, gold just really doesn't, you know, volcanoes have basalt and other kinds of rock that comes out of them. And there's never been a volcano found that erupts liquid gold. It just doesn't work that way. So I hope you enjoyed today's video about the origins of placer gold and where it comes from because it's an important topic to help you become a better prospector. And actually when talking about being a better prospector, I want to help you do that. And I've written a book about prospecting. In fact, it's like an encyclopedia. It's basically everything you need to know. And I put a link to it uh, in, in the description below and how you can get to it in Amazon. But I've got a section that I want to tell you a little bit more about my book and why you should really like it. If you look on some of the comments, you'll see that uh, people really like it, some of my comments. And speaking of comments, if you have any questions or want to talk about the origins of Placer Gold, you want to know more about it, feel free to ask me because I answer my comments. If you look below, I answer questions that people give me. So I do my best anyway. So anyway, let me tell you a little bit more about my book because I think you'll be really interested in it. Okay, so I wanted to tell you a little bit more about my book. Um, I wanted to be able to share the knowledge that I've gained about finding gold and, and how to be successful. And so I spent years literally writing this book, Fistful of Gold. It's more than 350 pages long, which is why I say it's an encyclopedia of everything you need to know about finding your own gold. Um, I've sold more than 8,000 copies and I've got a lot of really great feedback on it. It just is the most complete book on the market. It has information about finding gold that literally is not available in any other book that you're going to find for prospectors because I took technical stuff from geologists and other um, mineral scientists and I've translated that into language that the average guy can understand. You don't need a PhD to go out and find gold, but the information that scientists have learned over recent decades can can be of a lot of help to people. So it's in this book. Uh, if you're interested about finding gold, panning, sluicing, nugget detecting, uh, dry washing, the geology of gold deposits and how they form, it's all in here. And like I say, it's more than 350 pages long. 
So if you'll just go to the description underneath this video, um, you can take a look. I've got a link in there to take you to Amazon to the site where the book is sold. And I think you'll you'll really enjoy it. Take, take a look at all the people who've commented on this and have really liked the book. It has a, a very, very high rating for a book. And also, I have a, a website, my own free website that uh, you can take a look at. Um, I've got all kinds of information on here about uh, doing research and how to find gold, a lot of good information, stuff that basically uh, couldn't fit into my book. And so I put it on this website and I have a, a link also for that in the video description. So take a look in the description and you can click on the, uh, the link and it'll take you to my website. And finally, if you like this presentation, I've got a lot more coming out. Here's a three and a half ounces of gold that I found a couple years back in one area. Um, I've got a lot more of these videos coming on gold, gemstones, hard rock, placer, a lot of metal detecting. There'll be lots of metal detecting stuff. So if you really enjoyed this, click the subscribe button and then tick the notification bell off and YouTube will let you know when I publish new stuff. And hit the like button as well. And please comment on these videos because I'm interested in what you have to say. And I promise to answer any questions you have. So if you are wondering about anything or think maybe I didn't cover something thoroughly enough in a video, then let me know and I'll be happy to try and help you out and give you whatever information you need. So thanks a lot and um, hope you enjoyed this and we'll see you again real soon.